All right, we have with us tonight a very special speaker who's got more years of experience than a lot of us. Uh, well, some, some of us have been alive, let's just say. Um, we have with us someone with 25 years of IT experience, 15 years of experience as a book author in tech books. Um, on top of that, he's worked at MySQL, and he's now the CTO of SkySQL, and he's going to give us this insanely awesome presentation on MySQL, high availability, reloaded. I've been making a way out of it. Thanks. Thank you. So, David, hi. And, uh, well, thanks for the, the, the introduction. And uh, so, my name is Adam Salati. I'm the CEO of uh, SkySQL. Uh, who knows SkySQL? Okay. 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 Well, I have just two slides. I promise you. No, that's more than that. Then three slides. Actually, there is uh, another one for that. Actually, three is uh, the, the, the maximum number. Uh, just a very quick, uh, um, a brief introduction. Uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, yeah, I've been around for about 25 years in, uh, in the IT industry. I'm originally Italian and I live in the UK. Um, I've been now uh, in a place called Windsor in London, which I, I really love. And I, it's very close to the airport because I travel a lot. Um, I'm here pretty much, like, uh, I'd say, 50% of my time now. <laughs> US uh, between East and West Coast, and uh, Jamie is my colleague. Uh, and he's uh, on the same side, and we work together with the customers and users, and we also present events and so on. Uh, so, the, the presentation for today uh, is really uh, related to, of course, to high availability and HA with MySQL. So I'm sure that uh, uh, you, you already know the topic and that you may have already used some of the uh, technologies that I, I will uh, present and maybe some others will be new to you and uh, I hope that will be, of course, it will be helpful to, to see what uh, is available today. I would say um, that there has been a, a really a significant change in the high variability uh, of minus square between, let's say, 2007, 8, or 9, and today. So there's been like three, four years very active with new technologies uh, and, uh, and great new solutions uh, that are available. So I, I wanted to really present that to you. And of course, uh, uh, this is a presentation that goes to uh, of our two main events uh, where, where there is a really lot of interest on this topic. So the agenda, as I said, first we will have a three slides about Sky Square, just to present the company, uh, a bit of theory uh, around the high availability, uh, and then we will definitely get to the solutions for MySQL. And then just a few last words and uh, uh, suggestions and recommendations we take as you would like, of course, and uh, you make yours in a way where you think, okay, that may be helpful for me or not, not, not really, or whatever. And of course, uh, all sorts of questions, uh, any Anything interesting, any comment, uh, whatever, you know, of course, feel free to ask, and uh, hopefully, I will uh, be able to answer. If there is something specific or you know, the slide you see, again, feel free to stop me. I, I'd like to have you know, have a, like a, an interactive presentation. So, SkySQL, uh, the name AB, SkySQL AB, AB stands for, it's a, basically the equivalent of a limited company. Uh, uh, SkySQL is a Finnish company. You may remember MySQL AB, uh, capital A and capital B, was a Swedish company. Uh, MySQL has been acquired uh, in 2008 with Systems. I was part of it, uh, as Jake was, of course. I joined, by the way, I joined MySQL in 2005. And uh, uh, after the, the Senate position, we went on, I would say, business as usual, and more uh, interest uh, from uh, all our Sun colleagues uh, um, regarding, of course, the data And then uh, in 2010, we became acquired by Oracle. And uh, Oracle, of course, is going on with, uh, with uh, MySQL. Uh, but some of us uh, just decided to leave and uh, we to uh, find uh, other opportunities and uh, for new adventures, and uh, of course, uh, Jamie and I are uh, uh, um, ones that left. Uh, so, we are funded by the original founder, 
first talk about my SQL AP, quantity and assembly in Plasma, and uh, my AWS investment through Quantum Corps, uh, who's based here in Boston in the East Coast. Um, we are a team of 40 people now, we operate in 14 countries. But in pure, uh, I would say, uh, MySQL uh, um, standards means that we have people spread all over the world uh, um, providing support, uh, consulting, training, uh, some sales and marketing, of course, and administration, but we have a very limited team for that, and we are mostly, of course, technical guys for that. Uh, the main difference between us and other companies is that uh, SkySquare is very much focused on services, uh, and uh, we are backed by a product engineering team and multi programming team. So let's say that uh, multi program are our consultants, they take care of uh, all the development, and actually they uh, develop MariaDB. Does anybody know MariaDB? <coughs> so MariaDB is basically a branch of a uh, uh, SQL, of the original MySQL, uh, with some extra features. But it's not, of course, the topic tonight, but if you are interested, of course, we can, uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, and by, of course, uh, top community contributors and uh, some commercial partners and then uh, users are going to be pay more uh, quality and uh, more features to the whole uh, MySQL environment, not just the server per se, but also uh, some technologies all around us. And uh, the offering uh, from us is very simple. We provide, we provide what we call enterprise subscriptions, meaning uh, we uh, provide a, a, some, uh, uh, some services uh, like technical support uh, and uh, health checks uh, and some tools like monitoring administration to for a MySQL and we support all the, the, the most used distributions and branches available. And we provide some consulting and training again around this. Okay. Um, one important, very important uh, point is that uh, uh, the idea is uh, to use uh, not just MySQL, as you can see the logo here, but something that is definitely bigger, because we believe that uh, the, all this idea of collaboration and all the great technologies that are around the MySQL and the MySQL ecosystem, that, that makes really MySQL more, let's say, important, ubiquitous, and definitely uh, uh, capable of uh, doing more and more things, like uh, working in data warehousing applications or in uh, uh, some uh, complex integration uh, activities, etc. So we are partnering with uh, uh, some of these uh, companies that you can see the logos here. So uh, like I've seen one of the other t-shirts from Tech, for example, or uh, uh, InfinityB is another storage engine. So I'm not naming all of them, just to give you an idea about the fact that we, we don't work just with the database, but uh, with the, the whole ecosystem. And also, Continuum is another company we work very well with. Uh, and uh, Continuum will be also Represent tomorrow. Right? You have the place in some words, I guess. All right. Um, and then we have called this uh, um, basically this set of products all integrated the Sky Square reference architecture because we provide and recommend that uh, these technologies that work very well together. Right. Now, let's dig into the, 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 the main topics here. Um, so first of all, let's start with a little bit of theory just to create a common uh, base for everybody uh, on, uh, on high availability. I'm sure that uh, most of you already know all these topics, but maybe it's good to clarify some of these aspects. Well, the first uh, term to uh, leave you and consider is, of course, uh, the, what the high availability means. And, uh, well, this is uh, strictly from, uh, of course, from Wikipedia as you may expect, but I would like to add a few comments to that. So, uh, first of all, we talk about availability, and then we define that this availability is really a high availability, but we define also that the system, and this is quite important, we're not talking about a database or a server, but the whole system is designed uh, to be available uh, for a certain amount of time. And we usually measure this availability in uh, nines, and we find that the system must be like 90% available or 99% <coughs> up to or down to the famous five nines, uh, where that means that we can afford to have uh, 
no more than uh, five minutes of downtime in the year. And when we talk about downtime, we do not refer just to uh, a failure, a crash, or a, a hardware problem. We refer to uh, any kind of downtime. It can be an upgrade, so it can be an unplanned downtime, but we want to put the system down, do something, and then restart. So of course, five minutes is really, I mean, it's a lot. And uh, if you look at your, uh, maybe, uh, your online uh, bank account, I think it's more than five minutes. I don't know, maybe, I mean, my experience is that pretty much when I, I, I mean, I work quite a lot, you know, at night, and maybe at 2 a.m., guess what, I try to check on my account balance, and I mean, the system is down there, so, okay. Um, so, it is, it is definitely a lot. And um, this is quite important because uh, when we visit uh, users, iPad users, they keep saying, oh, we really want five nights for our database. But it must be a five nights, a six nights, or maybe 100% highly available. Yes, that, that's a great thing to say. Uh, it's quite complicated, it's, it's a complex thing to do, and very expensive. So people don't realize that. Uh, the number of nights are very much related to the zeros we have to add to your check and we of course you buy the technology and the services around that. It is really, really complicated. And there is another point. Uh, if you create a very <coughs> complex system, then this system is probably uh, can fail and it probably even fail than, than a, 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 a simple system. So that's another very but let's go on and let's see some of the other aspects. Um, and of course, when we talk about availability, we say, okay, uh, there must be some faults and they, they affect the availability of my system. So I need to make my system fault tolerant. What does that mean? It means that uh, uh, if something goes wrong, if I have a failure of hardware, software, whatever, uh, I have to, I want my system to continue to operate, so I want to operation on my system, that means that the system is for Now, here is another aspect, very important aspect to consider. This is not an excellent science, meaning uh, it depends really how crazy you are in terms of fault tolerance. You may say, I'm happy to manage one fault, or I'm happy to manage two faults, or three, or five, or fifteen. Uh, but the point is, uh, you should clearly define you are designing an HA solution, you should be able to find what you want to achieve, you should define what you want to design. You want to design a system that is fault tolerant up to a certain level. Because uh, again, that will affect uh, the complexity and the cost of your overall your environment. Your infrastructure. Okay, here is another two terms uh, that are quite important and of course we will use them later when we talk about the solutions around my square for hyperability switchover and fadeover. Uh, we tend to use uh, both uh, in the same way but uh, the, the, strictly speaking switchover means uh, I can switch over from one system to another system that is a redundant system and usually I do this operation manually so I physically switch from one server to another and, I, and, and there is a macro operation around it. Well, the, the failover means that uh, if there is a failure on one system, something automatically moves, uh, let's say, the activities on another system. So the difference between uh, uh, the switchover and failover is the fact that one is manual and the other one is uh, automatic. And here is another uh, important aspect to consider some Goals for you to say, uh, do you really need something that provides automatic failure? Is it so important? And the answer may be yes, of course, but uh, you should <coughs> seriously consider the fact that if you create something that is automatic, of course, again, you have complexity, you must handle this complexity. There may be some rules that define, okay, when is the right time to fail over, and maybe these rules are wrong, or uh, they are not very well tuned. So uh, again, it's another uh, aspect to consider. Maybe, I would say maybe, 
Uh, switch over, manual switch over is quite a complicated thing to do, and fade over, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that seems easy, but it's, it's not, from what I uh, just explained. Okay, so you should consider something that I think as an uh, aided switch over, meaning you can have some scripts or some uh, specific tool that can really help you in uh, applying a manual switch over, but these scripts, they maybe do some checks for you, they work on uh, some, uh, I don't know, some logs uh, or some operations that you should do usually yourself by typing lots of uh, lines of, uh, um, on, on your terminal, or maybe the, the screen will do it for you. So that, that is another uh, interesting point. And uh, <coughs> we talk about failover, switchover. Let's refer also to the fake map. What happens when uh, I fix the problem? gets fixed in some way and uh, I have to take this system again again back into the overall infrastructure <laughs> again. Uh, that is another important aspect uh, that uh, we want to consider because uh, it makes the whole system again more complicated and uh, you may really need to spend more money to that thing to activate that thing. Okay, we already mentioned downtime, and uh, I would say it's pretty simple, I think, when we talk about planned or scheduled downtime and unplanned or unscheduled downtime, where clearly when we plan the downtime, we really want to do an upgrade, we need to change something, so we, we can scale it and we can maybe take the system down or one of the modules in the system down for quite some time. Uh, and we do it when, uh, when, of course, that is really less, uh, when we have less traffic, for example, so it affects, uh, or less affects our operations. If we have an unplanned or unscheduled downtime, of course, that means that we have probably an error or a fault or something that we, we do not expect. Um, and uh, in this case, of course, uh, uh, this is more complicated. I'm almost done with that, but of course with that little theory. Uh, single point of failure is off. Uh, so when we have uh, a single component that uh, if it fails, uh, it takes down the whole system, then we refer to this uh, component as a, as a single point of failure. And of course, uh, when we design a highly available solution, we don't want to have single point of failures. Because that is really uh, what we absolutely need to avoid at any cost. Uh, the, the main, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the usual uh, uh, solution for this is the, the use of redundancy. So we need to have like uh, two or more uh, modules or components here. So for example, two routers here, or two servers, uh, and so on. That is a redundancy. So you use in order to avoid this. And you can do this here, of course, in the next uh, slides uh, that is uh, uh, nice. <coughs> and uh, I think the last point, disaster recovery and business continuity. So uh, you can have a fantastic, highly available solution, uh, but guess what? Uh, you can always have a disaster, like some, something that was absolutely unexpected, you have not designed anything to prevent such disaster, and so definitely you should uh, consider uh, a kind of disaster recovery process. So even if you have uh, uh, something that you haven't expected, you did not expect, then you should have, for example, uh, 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 or let's uh, say, um, document the process to restore your backups, uh, to restart your system uh, on other servers or a different data center or whatever. And that is another very important uh, aspect to consider. Just as a last resort when something goes terribly wrong. And uh, we all know that these things can happen. I mean, uh, there are earthquakes, uh, there are fires, uh, uh, there can be anything. And from the disaster recovery, uh, another term that you may have heard is of Once you have recovered from a specific disaster, then of course you have to, or you want to guarantee 
that your business keeps going and, uh, and that is keep moving. And uh, it is uh, absolutely fair to uh, to uh, have uh, a disaster recovery process <laughs> and put the information like uh, that. Just uh, as a simple example. Right. So when we when we design a highly available solution, uh, you may have already, of course, uh, uh, consider this a, 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 if you have already uh, installed MySQL and uh, you have to sort of, of course, to use uh, something highly available for MySQL, or <coughs> based on what I uh, I presented so far. Some of the, of the, the questions you have to ask yourself are, <clears throat> okay, which level of high availability do I need? So, as I said, do I really need five nines, do I need uh, four nines, whatever is your uh, requirement? Do I require no loss of data at all? And then and here, again, uh, you may say, oh no, that if I lose data, that means that my system is not available, it's not high available. Now, that's not true. I mean, Sometimes it's absolutely well, acceptable to lose some data. It happens uh, every day in every organization, even the, the, you know, the most uh, the secure environment lose, can lose data. So of course we do our best, but uh, uh, just uh, bear in mind that that is possible. And uh, the more you try to avoid that, the more you have to give up other things like performance, for example, or scalability or other things. Uh, do I need failover, or is switchover just enough? Or uh, as I as I mentioned before, aided switchover that's enough. And uh, can I provide a reasonable uh, service when one of the modules one of the points are down? Because again, we refer to the high availability of, of uh, the whole system, but maybe uh, we can really survive with uh, a let's say a not complete service. Like uh, we can have a window environment, so you cannot maybe do some transactions. Okay, let's say just as a, to a basic, very simple example, you may have an e-commerce website. Okay, you can still uh, uh, surf uh, your catalog and maybe put something in your basket, but you cannot complete the transaction because for whatever reason your transaction system uh, doesn't work, it doesn't hold uh, 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 the credit card top in your bank. So. You can't do that, but you can uh, still uh, provide something to your customers. Uh, so that is another, another important aspect of this. And uh, the first bullet up here, the availability versus currency, <coughs> is one of the most important aspects to consider. Uh, people used to uh, confuse what availability is with uh, scalability. So when we refer to availability, we basically uh, consider that uh, uh, our system under, let's say, normal operations, uh, and uh, with normal, we refer to a specific uh, amount of traffic uh, and uh, bandwidth required and so on, uh, the system must work. And if there is a fault, there is more tolerance, so we can actually uh, sustain the traffic and keep going even with one of the uh, fault in place. Uh, with scalability, uh, we refer to the fact that the system can sustain a certain workload. Uh, and we can define the workload in uh, many ways. It can be transactions per second, it can be uh, um, bytes per second that we need to receive or send or store or retrieve and so on. Uh, number of users, number of page visits, use whatever. And we should not confuse the two things. And we should not try to uh, design a solution with these two things in mind at the same time. So we should first consider what you want to create in terms of a scalable solution, and then you can make it high available. Or first you can make it high available and then you can make it scalable, but not together. If you try to fix it together, that is a big mistake. And also from, a, let's say, from our side, from the side of a, a, a companies who provide uh, services and products, 
that is uh, a little bit confusing. We try to uh, solve all the problems in once, but we should uh, actually distinguish them and say, okay, here is what you can do for your high level solution, here is what you can do for your level solution, and then you can combine it together. And in this way, you may identify what are the costs for uh, scalability, and what are the costs for high availability, for example, and what you need to provide as a high available solution, which is, of course, the topic tonight, not scalability. And uh, here is another very important point. Uh, maybe we are crazy for uh, the high availability of our database, and we forget basic things, like uh, the system is not really high available. We forget that we do not have like a, um, uh, maybe two network devices. We have only one client, and that's not enough, of course. It's a single point of failure, and so on. And uh, we should always review and be very careful with uh, what are the service level agreements what we promise to our users, customers, whatever, and uh, be careful with, uh, with uh, the fact that you may not have something in place that can really respect this. So start from this if you can, you negotiate your service level agreement and then you read the solution. Okay, so that, that is just a, a basic uh, um, set of terms uh, that would help in understanding a little bit more uh, the high value solutions that we can see on my screen. Is there any, any questions so far? <coughs> okay, so let's see what kind of solutions we have today. Um, and there are others as well. I mean, I tried to uh, really create a, a good set here, but I'm sure there are others uh, that uh, you may mention or you may use already. Um, of course, feel free to mention them or uh, we can uh, talk about that if you're very interested in some aspects. Uh, of course, again, it's very uh, So, again, this is not 100% uh, perfectly correct. Uh, it's just uh, an idea, meaning that uh, uh, we start from the basics down here with uh, the standard MySQL regulation, and we go up, 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 up to a certain point, which is definitely uh, probably something that I would really like to pass to you. Uh, I want to say that we need a good thought for tonight. Uh, the best availability is the one that combines lots of solutions, not just one solution. Of course, it's important to identify the solutions that work together. You cannot just say, okay, we pick up this one and this one, and there you go. No, you have to really select what you need, but by combining them, you can achieve the best availability for your system. And when we start with uh, uh, this topic, with high availability, we always refer, first of all, to what we have uh, out of the box for MySQL in MySQL reputation. That is a uh, simplest uh, that we choose to use, is to implement and run. Of course, there are pros and cons, but generally speaking, it's the best and simple uh, solution that uh, we can have. Um, who is not using MySQL reputation? So that means that all, all the others have, uh, they in some way use MySQL application, right? Okay. So uh, you may use reputation for uh, scalability. As uh, we said uh, before, you know, there are different aspects of scalability and scalability. So for scalability, of course, uh, you replicate data to your server, your slaves, uh, and these slaves are available for read only operations, and you can spread the work out of your uh, operations on that. Uh, on these days. But in terms of a high availability, the main point is that uh, if I have a, a fault on this server, I can continue to operate in a way or another. Meaning it might take uh, minutes or even hours sometimes to, uh, pay, uh, to switch over, but I have uh, the data safely stored somewhere else. So even if I have this uh, uh, Maybe the rack with this server on fire and I lost everything. My data is sometimes it's on another rack, hopefully not on the same one, <laughs> which is available 
here and uh, on one of the stages. Uh, so the uh, replication can be asynchronous, and that is what you can get from a standard MySQL replication, like when I want to use uh, MySQL 4, 5, 1, 5, 0. Or it can be semi-synchronous uh, when you use uh, uh, 5, 5. Is anybody using semi-synchronous replication here? Nobody? Do you know the difference between asynchronous and semi-synchronous? No? So, with asynchronous replication, which is the standard, the default for, uh, for uh, MySQL, when you write something, and uh, generally speaking, you write it on the master, okay? You write something on the master, and then uh, let's suppose that you use InnoDB. So with InnoDB, you have transactions. You can have a service operations, and then you commit your transaction. When you commit your transaction, uh, this transaction is stored on the binary block. And that's it. That's what you have to do. And uh, this is uh, a synchronous replication because uh, the server will accept your request, your commit, and it will uh, immediately acknowledge the commit. At some point, it can be immediately, or it can be after, I don't know, minutes, seconds, hours, whatever, this transaction will be replicated on this list, but it happens asynchronously. So, because it, the operation is asynchronous, of course, something can happen between uh, 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 you know, the time you commit and the time you replicate. And the result is that if you haven't uh, replicated this transaction, it's lost. Because uh, let's say that if I have, again, a case of fire on the format, I have the uh, entire flash storage here, this stored on this server, it's gone. And my data is gone as well. And these transactions, if the transactions have not been replicated, are gone with the, with the whole server. So in 5.5, uh, Oracle has introduced uh, what is called the semi-synchronous replication, which means that uh, when you commit to your master, uh, the acknowledge for this commit uh, will be sent back to the client only when uh, at least one of these servers will receive this transaction, this new transaction. So let's say you are safe. You have uh, now your data, which is here and somewhere else, or it's nowhere, meaning that if uh, something happens uh, during these specific operations, uh, the commit does not go through. And, uh, and basically, uh, it's like a roadmap. We do not have this data uh, written here and inconsistently not available here. Now, unfortunately, uh, that is almost true, but it's not. Okay, I know almost true is not the proper concept, but the point is, it doesn't work exactly this way. Unfortunately, the synchronization of the binary log is not transaction. It's not part of your transaction. So you still, even if you have a, if you have a, the semi-synchronous replication, you may lose your data. What you have to do is to basically set up the binary log and keep everything within your uh, transactional environment. And in order to do that, uh, there is a specific aspect that is available on, uh, on uh, MariaDB, and it will be available on 5.6, uh, as soon as 5.6 uh, will be, of course, uh, GMB, which is the concept of the group commit. So the group commit is a specific uh, uh, operation that makes uh, the synchronization and of, uh, of the binary log and uh, of the relay log in this case uh, within the transaction. And uh, it also does another thing. I mean, the, the, the group commit, basically, it's, a, uh, it's an operation that can uh, commit parallel transactions. So basically, instead of having a commit uh, write all the transactions in one go, all the transactions that have been received by the server uh, in parallel within this small interval. So, 
What I'm saying here is that with the basic MySQL replication, we have a, 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 let's say, a reasonable level of availability. If we apply the seed being blocked, the service enforced replication with group commit, we have pretty much no loss of data with uh, standard MySQL replication, which is one, of course, of the, of the, the, the objectives uh, uh, that we, uh, we are trying to achieve with, uh, with the same as there are also other aspects to consider here, like uh, um, with, uh, with 5.1 first and then with 5.5, uh, Oracle has released a new version of InnoDB, and, uh, and there is a new file format called Barracuda. Have you ever heard of it? Okay. So Barracuda is a new file format for, uh, uh, for uh, the InnoDB uh, plugin in 5.1 and the standard InnoDB in 5.5. Now, by default, in 5.5, Barracuda is, uh, uh, is off. So when you install in the famous 5, 15 minutes or 5 minutes nowadays uh, your MySQL server, you start the server and you have in the DB with the old form until. Why? Because uh, the problem that they found uh, at, uh, at Oracle MySQL the MySQL team at Oracle is that you can use Barracuda for sure in your application, but all the masters and the slaves must have Barracuda uh, as a format. Otherwise, you start having something that is pretty much pretty inconsistent in terms of size. For example, because with Barracuda you can have a different size, you must have an IDB fiber table uh, set on. With Antelope, you can use a single data file. You will not have compressed data, so that will generate several issues in your application environment. So by default, it's off. If you want to send it on, of course, it's your choice. And, uh, of course, it's a great choice, but you must really do it on all your servers. And replication is great for a uh, uh, planned downtime. When you, for example, you are planning an upgrade, a rolling upgrade, for example, if you have like uh, this service, you need to install a new version of your uh, uh, application uh, or uh, a new version of the database, then a rolling upgrade is just perfect. And the uh, MySQL application works very well for that. So it's still really the, the, you know, the entry point for high reliability and still really good really solution. Um, some time ago, uh, say a few years ago, um, uh, we started to uh, see uh, some interesting projects regarding multi-master replication, which is something that uh, uh, in, the, in the MySQL community has been really uh, required for a long time. But it's not easy to achieve. I mean, multi-master replication means that uh, uh, we don't have only one master and multiple slaves. We want to have many slaves. We want to have uh, slaves that uh, can accept read and write operations and that can update each other. Okay, that is uh, a good uh, thing to say and, and uh, maybe a good thing to do, but it's not that easy. So there are products that do this, but uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, tool, MMN, wasn't really uh, the best tool for the, for the job. So actually, there are some problems that uh, have been identified after a few years. So here, you can see a couple of uh, uh, URLs, uh, one you know, for, for each one, uh, blog, and this one is from Baron Schwartz. And, uh, you may know the name of things, of course, where they talk about the problems that they have found with the uh, MMN. It is actually quite, uh, um, interesting because of course uh, the first uh, uh, first reaction was oh wow it's fantastic it's great and unfortunately after a while they realized that, uh, that it wasn't that great and uh, I would say MMM uh, nowadays is pretty much dead because uh, it's not supported anymore it's not evolving there are other uh, solutions around that for uh, the moment of the event. but still we can find some uh, installations in the Okay. So, 
so one of the, of the new um, uh, solutions we have, uh, we have seen around that is uh, what we, uh, what is called MHA. So it's, uh, it's a solution, well, first of all, MHA stands for Master High Variability. And uh, the MHA, or MHA, MHA tool is a Master High Variability tool. It, basically, here we refer to a, a, a set of scripts, mainly two scripts. One is a node manager that is installed on uh, each server here. And the other one is the HA manager that can be installed on any server. You should have more than once, of course, to avoid a single point of failure. These scripts, uh, uh, they are, uh, well, first of all, they control uh, the, the slaves, how healthy they are, and uh, they check if everything is fine with the MySQL instance. And in case of fault of the master server, they, uh, the, the, the HA manager sends a, a, a failover operations to these uh, node managers. So basically, there is a, 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 an automatic failover that creates a new master. And uh, let's say that we can identify a master uh, amongst these four slaves here. So we can say that here is a new master. And the other slaves are you refer to this master. Now, the, uh, the good news, this is not what it does, but it's something I would say better. The good news is that this script uh, uh, also checks uh, the status of the logs, of the binary log and the relay logs. So when it does this uh, uh, automatic operation, first it checks if uh, the logs are all in sync, and if they are not in sync, it synchronizes all the logs, and then it applies a failover. And that is what I call the, uh, the aid switchover. So you may, uh, you may want to, I mean, it's up to you, of course. I mean, it works pretty well, but you may consider to uh, disable the, the failover, so the, the automatic operations, but still keep the, uh, the scripts in place to synchronize all the logs. Because that is probably the most complicated operation, so you do not want to do manual. So that is really uh, a good part of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the tool. By the way, the tool is uh, uh, being designed by um, one of our ex-colleagues, Yoshinori Matsunobu, uh, and uh, it's, it's really great. I mean, and they, uh, there are lots of uh, companies now using it. Um, and we're, there will be more, meaning that uh, there are uh, some good companies uh, that are now considering to use it and they will uh, announce it, uh, uh, what I understand, in uh, a news conference. So there, there, I, I can see that there are lots of uh, uh, texts and proof of concepts around that. It's definitely a, a something, uh, something to to look at if you are interested in uh, using verification and uh, anything more than just the standard verification. Uh, we fully support it as a company and we think it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, it's absolutely, of course, GPL available for everybody. You can see the URL uh, right down there. It's very interesting. And now we will be trying to sell it. Here is another uh, interesting uh, product that is related to, again, the concept of replication. And again, replication is very much in, in line with the idea of, uh, uh, of the redundancy, of course, because you make your data redundant. So, Tungsten Replicator uh, is a product from, uh, from Continuant. Uh, it's licensed uh, under GPL, so of course it's available for everybody. And uh, uh, you, can, you can download it and try it yourself. Uh, and what it does, uh, it creates this replication uh, that is, uh, at this point, a truly multi-master replication, where basically you can, uh, you can replicate from multiple uh, servers. Uh, and you can also create uh, 
with this uh, uh, so-called funny, meaning that you can have maybe more than one master trying to on one slave. Um, why? Because uh, we have the concept of the global ID that identifies each transaction within a cluster of, uh, of nodes. And that is, of course, uh, a great thing. Um, it also provides a, a, a parallel replication, which is something that is missing in the standardized web replication. Uh, it's per schema, so of course you can have a great advantage from, from this if you have any schemas and you want to basically go with this, uh, all the operations in the schema. Uh, do, you have, do we have any disadvantage for tungsten replicator? Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, basically uh, an external agent to the server. So it's not something that uh, comes with MySQL. It's not part of MySQL. It's, uh, it's provided by the computer as a company. It's, it's an, an external agent that comes. So by definition, being an external agent, uh, it does not provide uh, this uh, uh, absolutely no loss of data that comes with the fact that your module works with the transactional engine. It's, uh, it comes uh, in, a, in a way, let's say, asynchronous. So that is, uh, that is uh, if you want, some aspects that we want to consider. That way, of course, uh, is more scalable, but I would say less available compared to something that comes synchronously with a uh, new with transaction. Now, if you want, uh, a fully, uh, let's say, transactional and, uh, and with no loss of data solution then uh, basically Tungsten comes with another um, level which is called Tungsten Enterprise. In this case, it is not 100% GPL, meaning that it's uh, based on Tungsten Replicator, but of course on top there is another technology that can provide what I just mentioned, the fact that you can have uh, no loss of data and automatic failover, etc. So, of course, uh, you may want to consider this when you have like, uh, 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 this specific requirement. And in this case, the, the, the magic comes from the fact that uh, replicator is used to replicate the data, but uh, uh, on top here you have a connector that can, uh, uh, that can be used uh, to uh, control your request and to synchronize and keep everything, uh, let's say, uh, in sync with your, your specific uh, transactions uh, and uh, the availability of the data on the, on the cluster of servers that you have done here. But I mean, I'm not going, of course, to talk too much about this technology because uh, tomorrow, uh, continuing we'll talk about this, so we can, we can of course, come tomorrow and, uh, and hear more about this. There are other technologies available, again, related to replication. Um, the typical synchronous replication that you may see around uh, uh, nowadays, and uh, well, it's been around for quite a while, is DRBD. DRBD stands for a, a distributed replicated block device, and it, it doesn't refer specifically to MySQL, it refers to anything in a Linux environment <coughs> where you write something on your file system and basically the RBD captures this request and replicates the request uh, your block basically with this block from one server to another through an end. So uh, it is uh, a typical uh, active standby system where we refer to an active standby when we have a server that is of course working actively and another server that uh, cannot be accessed or in some way it does not provide your, uh, uh, the data, but it's there just in case of fault. So if something goes wrong here, we can always switch on. Uh, it is a fairly well-known solution. Uh, it comes with uh, some issues, I would say. Um, well, not issues, but we must consider, of course, uh, its limitations. One is that uh, the fact that you have a synchronous replication uh, all your song and, uh, and basically you must rely on this synchronicity on, on, on a network, uh, uh, on a network uh, layer here. It means that uh, if you have like a heavy load, heavy writes, uh, your performance may go down 
compared to a single standard standard of things. Again, here's my point about high availability and scalability. You should be careful, you should consider that if you are if you're considering a solution like a, a DRBD for high availability, you are giving up some performance in this and some scalability. <laughs> Another aspect uh, that uh, not many people like is the fact that uh, in this typical environment, this node is passive, meaning that it's sitting there, doing nothing, just waiting for uh, something to happen, something that goes wrong with your active system. So you may basically double the cost of your hardware and your infrastructure. Um, and a typical configuration uh, uh, I say with, uh, with real redundancy is related to the fact that you need uh, three, even better, four uh, network cards. Uh, so two for the heartbeat and one for the DRBD as a, as a, as a single uh, connection and then another one for uh, the, uh, the application. That's not strictly required, but definitely uh, better to have. And uh, the, the way it works uh, at, uh, at the client level, you have this built in address that will tell you from your active server to the standby for the passive server in case of fault, which is typical of course. But again, sometimes if you do not set this properly, you have like a, a, a failover that is definitely not necessary, and then you have uh, the downtime that you did not want. Because of course when you do a failover, you have a, you have a glitch in your system, so maybe it stays down for, uh, I don't know, uh, a minute, two minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and uh, maybe you do this and you do not really need it because uh, you may have just had some problems uh, on, the, on your master, but the master is not on your uh, active server, but active server is not really faulty. There is maybe a, a specific issue in terms of workload uh, or uh, something that uh, is only uh, temporary. Never heard about the era? No? Nothing? Okay. So, um, let's say this is a new kid, kid of the block, I would say, and uh, uh, something really, um, well, quite new, still uh, uh, at the very early stage, I would say. Uh, 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 so, there's a company, a Finnish company called Kodash. Uh, they have uh, developed uh, a synchronous replication uh, based on the MDB, first of all. So this solution works only with MDB as a storage engine, not with others. Um, and uh, it is uh, uh, multi-master with no single point of failure. So what does that mean? It means that uh, you can write on any server. In order to have something 100% safer, you should have at least three servers. If you have only one, only two servers, yes, you have redundancy, but you may have some issues on the, on the network, on the connectivity side, and then you create something that you really don't want to have, meaning a split brain. And when you have a split brain, basically you have two servers, and they both think that the other, their pair, is gone, is dead. So they think, oh, I am the one who has to keep up and, uh, and continue the operation. With three, as a minimum, of course, you always have an arbitrator say, hey, this, this server is up, this server is, is down, or uh, vice versa, for example. <coughs> this is the arbitrator. But anyway, when two still connect, then uh, the third one is gone. Now, Okay, this is a, I would say, a, on paper, it's definitely a good solution. There are some uh, aspects, very important aspects to consider. Again, in the light of the idea of uh, high availability, scalability, combined together, let's see. Uh, the first point is, uh, yes, in terms of high availability, it may be a good choice, because, uh, again, you have uh, no single point of failure if you have uh, designed properly. You have redundancy, or fine. But then, there is this aspect, multi-master, which is something that you, you try to fix another problem here. Again, the scalability aspect. Uh, now, the way 
the way Monte Master works here, basically you can write a, a, a transaction here and another transaction here, and you have to create this uh, synchronous replication. And this transaction may have a conflict. Now, the conflict is uh, handled in a way where basically uh, they call it optimistic conflict resolution, meaning that uh, hopefully they hope that uh, it will not happen. But if it happens, then they need to handle it. And uh, they handle it in a way where basically they will kill one of the transactions. Which one? Well, it's a, that's a, a question mark. We don't know. But that transaction will be killed after the conflict. So basically, you expect that the transaction is absolutely done, gone, and it's not. It's lost. So that is a, a, big, uh, a big problem. The other one, which is even more important, is that in terms of scalability, uh, if you do not have any conflict, scalability was just great. So if you handle this at an application level, fantastic. But as soon as you have a conflict, the conflict takes, uh, I don't know, a few milliseconds to be handled. And then maybe you have another conflict, and it takes another few milliseconds, and then another one. At some point, your system has really probably more conflicts, more conflicts, and it's it hangs. So, so my take here is that uh, okay, the technology sounds good, but it sounds really good if we do not want to do too much. If we do like a, a write and uh, we keep it as a highly available solution, maybe for read, or maybe we can also split the writes, but we must handle it again at the application level. It's not. A, a silver bullet that works for everything, and I just uh, load balance my application here, and uh, it's all done. Unfortunately, it's not like that. Yes. Do you know if the conflict resolution is configurable? Can we set the strategy? So no, not the no, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it is their strategy is specifically designed for that. So it's, uh, it's not. Uh, but still, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying this is not a good technology. On the contrary, it's really good. But it's good if you use it in a specific way. You shouldn't really do too much. Or if you do, more, you have to at least control it on top here in your time. Now, based on, uh, on um, Galera, uh, uh, the Kona created uh, uh, a version of MySQL for ex called XML cluster. Does anybody use uh, the corner server here? Probably. So basically it's another branch of MySQL. So similar to the Oracle version, but uh, with uh, uh, but from, uh, from another company. So what they have done, they have taken Galera and they have, uh, they have implemented it in, in an alpha version, it's still alpha of course. Um, um, based on Galera and uh, the their version of even the people next to me. So we do not have, uh, it, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, some of the aspects, as I said, are the fact that uh, you have aborted commits uh, and that there are other aspects to consider, like uh, the auto increments uh, must be uh, used in a specific way so you cannot mix up auto increments uh, on multiple servers and uh, there are other issues with XML transactions, etc. Some of these things can be fixed, so it, they will be probably fixed in the, in the next releases. So again, it's a, from a, from a, an ancient perspective, is definitely a good solution, and uh, and uh, you may want to consider maybe as a one of the aspects, uh, definitely uh, if you need that, if you need full replication. Another point you may have Schooner? Yes? Okay. So, uh, Schooner provides uh, another synchronous uh, master slave replication, but here is a, okay, um, let's say here I'm a little bit relieved. I, I would say, okay, this is good because uh, they do not try to do too much. This is again a master slave. It's not a master, master, everything was great. It's a master slave solution. So, in case of fault, you switch over to the slave, which is uh, hot and here available. 
Uh, and uh, if everything goes fine, you can read from here and write from here. And it works. And that's fine. So it's a solution uh, uh, that is not available in GPL, so it is a commercial solution. Um, it comes with a uh, quite uh, significant price tag if you want, but of course uh, uh, then you may have uh, your perfect solution, so you may be happy with that. So here, uh, the way it works, again, only on InnoDB, it's very similar to the same uh, concept that we have with Galera, meaning that you write on, the, on your database, specifically on the InnoDB engine, and synchronously uh, the request is captured and written on uh, the other, uh, it's called Read Master, so effectively it's the slave, uh, InnoDB engine. And the beauty of this is that uh, your buffer pool, so all your cache is uh, warm. So basically, if you have a fault here, you switch on or you switch over to this uh, to the other uh, uh, server, and your cache is already warm. So you don't need to go through all the uh, cache warm up <coughs> that is quite uh, uh, expensive, uh, which is again, as I said, a quite a good thing to do. And it works. I mean, replication works in parallel, which is another, uh, of course. Uh, uh, Just a, a standard uh, high availability solution uh, that you may want to consider uh, with uh, Linux or if you are a Windows user, uh, also with Windows, uh, which is based on a typical shared storage. So here you may say, hey, you talked about redundancy so far and replication, and now we are referring to a shared storage, but maybe that is a single point of failure. And actually, yes, I mean, uh, if I draw it in this way and I create like a, a, a pile of disks uh, in the, the same place, yes, it is a single point of failure. But actually, uh, in a very expensive environment, the storage other networks, uh, uh, this, uh, this pile of disks is usually uh, replicated uh, and uh, sparse, geographically sparse, maybe like a uh, uh, 200, 300 yards from each other with different runs, etc. And uh, the, the performance are very much related to the, these channels here. Uh, these are usually, of course, very expensive solutions. Uh, there are some inexpensive solutions, but I would say I'm staying stay away from them because then they do not provide the redundancy that you may want to get for a uh, hybrid. For uh, but as a, as a solution, it's, uh, it's very similar to the RBD. The difference is that you do not need to replicate the data, everything is handled here. Uh, it's an active passive solution. Um, and uh, you can use it with, uh, for example, with Windows 2008, which comes uh, out of the box, or uh, with, uh, with Linux, uh, uh, with a typical cluster solution, cluster solutions from uh, CentOS, uh, Red Hat, uh, etc. Um, now, of course, you can have like a, a, a small uh, share storage with uh, active passive two servers, uh, but uh, I would say what we see in the field when, when we, we go and visit our users and customers, we see some large deployments where maybe there are many servers and one big share storage down here, very expensive, but also, uh, let's say, uh, Helpful, but you, but you can of course control <coughs> all the operations down here. So basically, you will uh, run the, the MySQL servers uh, as an instance uh, on uh, like uh, one here, one here, and so on. And you have maybe two instances running on this server, and two on this server, etc. And in case of fault, all you do, for example, let's suppose that like, you have a problem on this hardware, you take these two instances to you start them on one of the available servers here, and that works with the, the same uh, data environment you have here. So you are very pretty much safe from this point of view. And you rely on the fact that your spare storage is, as I said, redundant. Yeah. So, in case of fault, as you can see, 
I am one uh, is here and I am uh, the most higher things. Okay. Right. Uh, so if you, uh, let's say, you, you create another level, another layer uh, on top of the shear storage dimension, then you end up with a, a typical concept of virtualized environments. And from here to, of course, a cloud solution, we are pretty much closed. Uh, and everything will be transparent for you, of course. So basically, in a virtualized environment, uh, uh, you have the very same concept of the shared storage. And so instead of having a, a, a single instance, you may have a whole uh, uh, VM running. Uh, you, you will rely on the fact that uh, uh, your uh, Virtualized software will uh, <coughs> restart the VM in case of fault, for example, of one of these servers, uh, but your data is still available here. So you can basically restart one of these uh, VMs on the main servers. And your data is again safely on the share store. Okay. And uh, so, when we talk about the, the theory, right, we refer to the disaster recovery, the business continuity. So again, so far we have talked about redundancy and availability uh, within a data center. And uh, but something can happen at the data center, or there may be a network problem that you cannot reach the data center. So of course the best thing to do is to have like uh, two data centers synchronizing uh, data between and bringing the data from one data center or even better, from one data center to two or three different data centers. So with this concept uh, in mind, we, we can use uh, MySQL replication, but not just MySQL replication, uh, and we can uh, create geographical replication. That means that uh, all your environment in one data center can be replicated somewhere in another place, geographically, uh, maybe uh, quite uh, distant. And, uh, and uh, in case of big fault, you have your data safely stored here. Uh, the, the basic solution for this is really MySQL replication. You can use MySQL replication and it works just fine. Of course, it's limited in terms of bandwidth. But it's, uh, it's definitely a good solution that we can use it. Uh, because uh, we are talking about quite, uh, I mean, if, uh, if we are like a, a thousand miles away, we will have latency, which is natural latency. It has nothing to do with bandwidth or whatever, but just physically, you know, to go from uh, A to B, it takes time. So you may want to use a synchronous application. And I would say it really is enough. I mean, there are people who want synchronous replication. The latency will kill performance. They may really be happy with this performance, but uh, you have to consider that uh, that will really keep your performance uh, separate. Um, as I said, you may use MySQL replication. You may use tungsten replication, for example. It's an RGPI solution that is available, and it provides parallel replication. Um, it's a uh, again. Do you have a semi-synchronous uh, solution? You can have semi-synchronous solution. Mm -hmm. It would work, uh, let's say, pretty much in the same way as a synchronous solution, meaning that it would uh, kill your performance. Yeah, because uh, I mean, the concept of semi-synchronous is that at least one slave must receive, let's say, the, the transaction. Right. So you may have like uh, three data centers, and you must at least synchronize one of them, so you have the same problem. So I would, I mean, again, you can do it, of course. You can have semi synchronous replication between the two data centers. I would say 99% of the time, I would recommend a synchronous replication. Uh, you may do this with a uh, with a MySQL replication or with Dunstan. Or you may want to do it with uh, uh, something that comes from, uh, for example, from the, the, the shared storage or from the storage program. 
So we are not talking about a specific MySQL solution here, but there is just, uh, I don't know, NetApp, for example, provides uh, this kind of snapshot firmware, and uh, they are particularly designed, particular designed to replicate your data through snapshots from one data center to another. Uh, again, you, you take it as it is, meaning that uh, it works, uh, it works uh, well with PinoDB, you just rely on the fact that uh, magically your data will go for A to B. And you don't know, you know, think about that. All right. Um, of course, last but not least, uh, MySQL cluster. Is anybody using MySQL cluster here, NDB? No? Okay. Do you know what? So, uh, simply speaking, MySQL cluster is another storage engine. Somebody mentioned NDB. That is MySQL cluster. NDB, network database. Okay. So you you, you uh, download from uh, from the MySQL website the community edition of uh, MySQL cluster, and what you have is a specific MySQL instance with uh, another storage engine called NDB. Now, uh, under the hood, what you have in reality is uh, one MySQL server, so a, a MySQL demo that you can manage, and uh, another demo that is called a data node, NDB demo, that is responsible for your data. So. The, the, the MySQL server will be just uh, an interface that provides uh, uh, the SQL interface. And you can use, of course, uh, your uh, favorite client, JDBC, PHP, C, whatever, to connect to the database server. And then the database server will connect to the data nodes that And your, uh, uh, the beauty of this solution is that uh, everything is redundant. You can have uh, multiple data nodes, you can have multiple SQL nodes, uh, they are all uh, active. Uh, you have redundancy, you have scalability because you will split data on all these, uh, uh, these data nodes. So if you have like, uh, uh, let's say, 100 gigabytes of data, you will have, <coughs> generally speaking, 25 gigabytes of uh, data on each data node if you see these four data nodes cluster. And down here and up here you have uh, like uh, two management nodes, of course redundant because you, need to, you, you don't want to end up rolling with one data node having a single point of failure. If you, you don't care about SQL, you can go straight into the data nodes using the API with C or uh, with J, with Java, and, and uh, interact with the data nodes. And that means that you will skip a quite thick, fat layer, and uh, your performance will be probably 10 times or uh, 50 or 100 times better. Now, you may say, wow, it's too good, it's too good to be true. Then here is the, the perfect solution. Uh, why, did you, why did I show you all the other solutions if this is perfect? And oh, by the way, some second table, if you have like a one, data node down, then all the others are still on. And when you can have an automatic, uh, an automatic failover, or you can have a, a fail back, you can have an online backup. Wow, it's so great. Now, there must be a path here, right? <laughs> and there is, actually. Because uh, this solution, uh, well, first of all, the solution has been designed to recycle in memory. So now you can have data on this, but the index uh, still resides in memory. So there is, of course, a limit because, yes, memory is, uh, is cheap nowadays and you can have uh, quite a lot of memory on every, on every uh, server. But still, you have a limit. So if you have like one terabyte of data, okay, check how much it will cost for you to keep it on uh, memory. And there is a quite a significant overhead of all the, let's say, the, uh, uh, different pointers and uh, um, structures that you need to uh, have to control your real data. So if you have like one terabyte of data, you will probably have like an extra 20 or 25% of space used for all these other 
no Amir for the data. That's one point. The other point is that uh, in order to make uh, this uh, system uh, highly available and also high performance in a typical uh, no SQL way, you automatically split your uh, and distribute your data on these nodes. But when you have a query that is quite a complex query with lots of joins, your request goes down from here to apply from client to the SQL node, and the SQL node needs to go and check data maybe on all these data nodes that you know. And the result is that you will have something like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 20 posts on this network down here. And if you compare the time to execute a query on cluster with like 20 network hooks with uh, the same time required uh, within a single server with a local disk, uh, even if uh, it's not on in memory but it's on disk, you will probably have a uh, definitely a better result on a single server, or even on a <coughs> server with MySQL replication, or, uh, which is a basic, of course, hyper-digital solution. So, what I'm saying here is that cluster is definitely fantastic, it's really good, a good solution, but you must know it, and if you are designing a solution around a cluster, you must really create your application with cluster in mind. So if you know exactly how it works, where you can go and get your data, what kind of query you can execute, and what queries you should not use and you should maybe modify, then you can, you can have a very good solution with Cluster. If you think you can replace your current uh, EWB uh, tables uh, with Cluster, I've never seen, really, uh, I've never seen a successful migration like that. Uh, apart from maybe, I don't know, a solution that requires no more than 10 queries per second, let's say. Okay. So uh, it, is, uh, it is great, but with these uh, very important uh, limitations. Okay, and then on top, on the client side, uh, you, have, uh, you have some uh, connectors uh, that can be, can be helpful. Because of course, uh, if you combine that with, uh, with your uh, HA solution underneath, then you can, for example, uh, just with the JDBC connector, have a failover system. So you can select uh, certain hosts and say, OK, if it doesn't work here, then I can switch over to another host and so on. You can do the same with, uh, with the PHP connector. Or uh, there, there are some proxies around, like Scalebase provides a proxy server. It's a closed source solution, but uh, available now that does pretty much the same uh, uh, job that uh, MySQL Proxy used to uh, do in, a, in an experimental way. You can actually provide failover from one server to another. And uh, of course, again, the best solution is to combine, to combine these things together. Now, uh, the first uh, presentation uh, that I <coughs> Somebody said, there is a comparison chart, so it's not a real presentation. <laughs> you must have a chart, so I argue. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't rely on that 100%, to be honest, because again, it all really depends on your, uh, on your needs, on your specific infrastructure, but hopefully that will help you a little bit to see how, how it works. So uh, I have made up here. Uh, the technologies that I mentioned, so the standard application, I mentioned the standard DLBD, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and here are some aspects you may want to consider. So I said, okay, MySQL application is not 100% data safe, but I, I mean, it can be, but if you download the standard MySQL from Oracle uh, and you run it, no, it's not. So there's a, there's a, 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 a <laughs> And, uh, and so is MHA if you do the same. Uh, when you start, you start having the, like the, the green light when you use Thumbstep Enterprise, for example, or you use the LED, but with the LED, you have uh, the big problem with the phones, so that is down here. Uh, 
You don't have it with the Galera because, as we said, you can have some transactions here. So we cannot say that it's a normal thing. Uh, it's, it's fine with cluster and VMs if you have a proper shared solution in place. Uh, geographical replication, uh, for what I I see is basically, and I, I define this basically the same for my story because so okay, again it's red. And uh, here we have a storage snapshot that is something that comes uh, um, specifically uh, at the need to us, so it's not 100% safe. And it is absolutely really fast. Now I'm not going through all of them, so just to give you an idea of the way I, we have a, a basically design. Uh, so I know that most of you use uh, even the bin, so maybe this doesn't really matter because uh, it would be all green with even the bin, well apart from cluster that runs on its own engine, which is NDB. But uh, DRBD doesn't work with my asset, for example, and so Galera, it's only the DB and it's only ours. Uh, automatic failover. Uh, okay, you see this uh, expression mark here. Uh, I'm adding this exhibition part because, yes, you can provide automatic failover, but you have to add another piece of software. It doesn't come automatically. It's not due to MySQL and MySQL replication. Uh, and so it's the same with Galera and the same with the shared customer set. Okay, now, and here we have a little bit more complicated stuff, like, okay, what is the overhead in terms of performance? So, definitely uh, things like, uh, MySQL replication doesn't provide much overhead, but also because it does not provide really uh, a significant contribution <coughs> to others. Uh, DRBD does definitely have an overhead. Um, for timestamp, we have two stars because uh, you may have been asked and you may be good or not, that's something you should consider. Um, and so on for the other you know, like uh, the snapshots, uh, the fact that you have uh, virtual machines and virtualized environments, which is, of course, fantastic for administration, but maybe not good for uh, overall performance. Uh, Ease administration and configuration, again, it's pretty simple with my SQL replication, maybe it's too complicated for DRPD and others. And the scalability, which is very much close to the idea of performance, but it's also related to the fact that you can use that technology for uh, uh, scalability as a second step. It's, uh, of course, uh, on this side. You can see, of course, all the replicated environments that are also active are a good fit for scalability. And the other side. And uh, just the uh, last thoughts here. Uh, some of the uh, requests that we, we can see when, uh, when we meet our customers, and users, people asking, oh, I have five lines, or uh, I want everything automatic, it must be automatic with the table. Mm -hmm. I want to migrate to my SQL class, as I said, I can't lose any data, and I need a subset of failover. So some of our, uh, let's say, uh, answers are, Sorry, I have uh, this automatic remote <laughs> control. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, you need five nines. Okay, fair enough. You may actually need five nines, but just be careful. So, <coughs> implement what you really need. Don't go over a limit that is not really a limit for you. I mean, if you are happy with three nines, just stay with three nines. Forget about the five nines. It's not more thing. It's Unless, of course, it's an excellent and something that is specifically defined. Uh, everything, everything must be automatic. As I said, maybe a switchover with some help from script can be, can be, can be more effective, inexpensive, and easy to implement. Uh, you want to migrate to MySQL cluster? Okay, is your application designed for cluster? If, if it is already designed for cluster, then it's not a migration. It's a, new, it's a new engineering angle. So consider that there is an extra cost attached to that. Uh, can the phone use any data? Okay. But Data is lost every day, so maybe, maybe there is a drop in performance that maybe it's not worth it, so think about that. And finally, okay, you need a subsequent failover. Okay, there are, there are some uh, 
timeout periods and warm up, caching warm up periods that are not considered usually, usually the failover, that are very, very important. So, sub second failover is something very, very difficult to achieve. Almost, I wouldn't say impossible, but again, you must design the whole solution, for including the application, for let's say, both of the application to have sub second failover. That is the key point. So, it's really difficult to achieve as, a, as something like a straight back solution. It's not. That's a, that's a new problem. I would say it would be very clear. Okay. Uh, the last one slide that I mentioned before, allow me to, to say that. Uh, we have a, a, what we call Skyscraper Enterprise HA, which is basically a full HA solution um, that supports Linux, Windows, Solaris on basically all the main distributions. Uh, and then uh, usually we have this uh, implemented in two or three days based on a acceptance test. Uh, we have selected some of the technologies, as you can, as you can see here, uh, standard reputation, PRTB, etc. Depends on the type of the, of the kind of uh, availability you want to achieve. And that is something that, of course, uh, uh, we provide to our customers uh, as, a, as a language. Uh, it's uh, very good to the, the Different 
operations. I, I log something and I manage the basket and uh, maybe I'm surfing my capital, then, well, I can see here three different storage engines and they work just very well together. So I would, uh, I would say uh, use cluster as uh, one of the, maybe the, the one of your uh, storage engines uh, for, uh, for session management in your application. Next question. Yes, I was wondering, uh, would you recommend to have two different databases, one for read and one for read and write, and then use different strategies for uh, each of the different databases? Strategy in terms of high availability, you mean? Uh, well, yes, meaning that if you have like a read write operation, that first of all it's easier to scale. You can have a typical uh, uh, MySQL replication, for example. Um, you can even make it read only and uh, compress your data or whatever, and have just another copy there to keep. The read write is more complicated, of course. Uh, you may want to have like a, a DRDB or a, the standard replication or anything that creates a, a, a redundant uh, a copy of your data. And yes, you can, but the best thing to do is to first of all, questions. Questions? So the some asynchronous uh, replication, does group mint then make that fully synchronous so that you have 100% of the data safe, or is it still it is 100% data safe the way it's been designed. Literally. So basically, Christian Vincent is the, the, the guy who has re implemented it. Because it, I mean, group commit is not a, a new thing. It was there uh, with 4 1, and then with 5 more, they uh, broke. And now Christian Vincent recreated it and made it better. Uh, so it is absolutely fully safe now. You have to have a uh, you have to have basically a uh, group commit and uh, and uh, basically the same thing also. But the the performance cost of the scalability cost compared to the asynchronous replication. Well, of course you have you have performance cost which is based on the latency uh, and the, the, the acceptance on the on the same side. Um, bear in mind when we refer to uh, like just keep making sure you don't think here. Semi-synchronous replication. When you when you have this uh, uh, synchron, synchronous operation, uh, that means that, that the generation is that the data is synchronously stored into the relay. It doesn't mean that it is available. When you read your data, you may not find this new information. It's just stored here. Okay. Uh, what what is uh, maybe the cost of this? Is uh, basically the, the time that you need to basically uh, copy this data from here to here and say fine, done, I send it. You do not, ex you do not expect a two-phase commit, that is too expensive, but you have a, a, a basically a, a send and approach. So there is anyway a cost. The, the fact that you have a good commit, of course, uh, it will relieve you from uh, 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 a, a higher cost, because uh, without a good commit, you send a single operation. So it goes in sequence every single transaction. With group commit, you can handle a group of transactions. That is a, the best solution. There is a, 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 a good uh, a blog from Mark Callaghan on Facebook that, because they, they use group commit. They have, actually they sponsor the group commit and they're using it into the, uh, the, the Facebook uh, bits. And it's really, it's really good. It shows you how it works and uh, the, the results. Okay, just yeah, one with a question. Um, you mentioned shared storage. Um, to be honest, I didn't know that was possible. So, I, are you saying that MySQL can actually use the raw storage files on like a, a network file system? Is, is that how it works? Yeah, that, that, is, uh, that is possible uh, uh, within a DB. Um, Absolutely 
possible with the MDD. Um, now, we've done some tests, uh, and with the, let's say that with the 5155, there is not really a significant difference uh, between uh, you know, the, the, the use of those devices uh, uh, and uh, the use of uh, the standard, uh, the standard uh, file systems that we want to use. With, uh, with direct attached storage or direct storage. So, um, if there is no advantage, basically, the best thing to do is to just use the standard solution. Any questions? Time for one more question. I noticed the uh, SQL was missing in the comparison chart. The, 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 uh, oh, it was missing on the chart, you're right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, does it, how does it compare? I mean, is it yeah, that's a good question. So let me try to fix this, and I will, uh, I will add it actually before I post it in the slides. The slides will be available on SlideShare. Uh, you, can, you can Google, of course. Uh, I mean, with the other I Serati, which is my last name, but you can you can find HA with your video. So uh, I'm also going to post up the video, all the slides with the video, and the video goes up as well. Yeah, of course. So the uh, let's say that in terms of uh, data safe, it is definitely data safe. Again, on the DVD, um, it's a red uh, uh, X for all storage engines because it's going to be uh, It does provide automatic. Yes. Uh, in terms of performance overhead, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is fairly good, so I would say it's uh, something that this is, of course, debatable, but we put one and two stars. Uh, in terms of administration and configuration, it comes with a uh, uh, console, so I would give it, uh, and, and uh, it's fairly simple to implement, so I would give it another one star. And in terms of scalability, uh, probably, uh, Two stars or something similar because uh, um, you can still you can read from the from the slave which is great again it's definitely a good, uh, a good choice and, uh, because you have like uh, your uh, your cache wall buffer pool wall it is also very fast so it would be probably something that you need to do. It's, and it's not here you're absolutely right so I should have it. thank you Ivan. Thank you.